Namaste, I am Raj Vedu. Welcome to this talk. This talk is titled provocatively as Not My New Year. So I'd like to explain a little more about that in the course of this talk, where I will address the history of calendrical systems focusing on the Indian calendar systems as well as other ancient civilizations around the world. And we'll try to see uh, why, why this is such a provocative title. To start with, uh, marking the passage of time was an activity that ancient Indians excelled at. In fact, I say it's a measure of a civilization if you're able to accurately measure the passage of time. And in today's talk, we'll see the extent to which other civilizations were able to mark the passage of time. So Indians had a time of the day, for example, using the panchanga, muhurtas, as well as gnomen, sundials, they could talk about water clocks, they could talk about the time of the day. Or they could also talk about the time of the month using either the sidereal uh, notion or the uh, synodic notion using nakshatra or the tithi model. Or they could talk about the time of the year using uttrayana, dakshinayana, the various ritus, either the seasons, the times for agricultural activities or festivals that they were observing, they could mark the passage of time across the year. They could track the age of individuals in either lunar years or in solar years. They could also track the passage of time with absolute markers of events with some epoch or some era and the number of years measured from that era. So all these things are known in ancient India. We also see that we have uh, 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 the, 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 the growth and calendrical knowledge is contained from stories to Siddhantas. Siddhantas are mathematical astronomy works. So the calendars of India clearly show a growth of knowledge, the use of uh, measurement devices to uh, track the heavenly bodies, the celestial calendar, if you will, modeling of the uh, uh, celestial movements for prediction purposes and estimation over very vast periods of time we are seeing both mathematical and astronomical knowledge over here. So let me start at the beginning over here. I'd like to show you first the evolution of calendars. We see that stories communicate knowledge about sidereal and synodic month and the solar year. All of us are familiar with this delightful story of the moon and how the moon married the 27 daughters of King Daksha. Now, I know some of some of you might wonder what on earth is just silly mythology that the ancient Indians had. But then do note, ancient Indians were not fools in anthropomorphizing the moon and bedding him to the 27 nakshatras. What they wanted to do was to communicate information about the stars that are on the path of the moon and to show where the progress of the moon along the path of the stars over there and to show that as a means to track the passage of sidereal time. That is what was intended in this particular story, which appears in Bhagavad Purana, Brahma Vivarta Purana, Vishnu Purana, and so on. And the story says that Chandra visited a wife every day. And this part of the story is related to the fact that the moon takes approximately 27.3 days to return to the same backdrop of stars. So this is the sidereal month, which takes this period of time. And the, we know that the moon traverses about 13.3 degrees in the sky in a 24 hour period. So if you multiply 13.3 by 27, you get 360 degrees. So the complete traverse. The story also says that uh, his father-in-law Daksha was furious with his son-in-law Chandra because he heard Chandra is favoring only one wife called Rohini more than the others. So he was so mad. He said, how can you neglect my other daughters? And he curses his son-in-law saying, you're going to die. Well, Chandra doesn't want to die. So he runs off to Mahadeva and uh, prays to him, please, I don't want to die. And Mahadeva gives him a boon and says that, look, I cannot change that curse. However, I'll alleviate it. After you fade away completely, then you'll again restore, come back to your original glory. So this part of the story is showing how uh, we can mark the synodic month using titis and, and so on. So we know that from new moon to full moon and back to new moon takes about 29.5 days. And so this story of Chandra is encoding the fact that it can be used both for sidereal time as well as synodic time. Both can be marked uh, in the story. 
What about the solar year? Were Indians aware of that? Absolutely. We are seeing again it's in Bhagavata Purana, Srimad Bhagavatam. There is a delightful story. For example, it says Vrika. Vrika is another name for the wolf, which is a nocturnal animal. It hunts at night and sleeps through the day. We know that. So Vrika, the Ashura, he got a boon from Rudra. And Rudra is another stand-in for Agni or the sun. That if he places his hand on a person's head, that person should die. So reluctantly, Rudra gives him the, the boon. And the minute he gets that, Ashra starts pursuing Rudra because he wants to see if he places his hand on Rudra's head, would he die? So Rudra runs away from him and uh, he's saved by a divine maiden who appears. And uh, the Ashura's enamored by this maiden, wants to marry her. And she says, you're an uncouth Ashura. What do you know about the arts? He says, look, I know all about the arts and so on. And so she starts dancing, asking him to follow her steps. And he does so. In the course of dancing, she touches her own head. Ashura forgets about the bone, touches his head, and he falls dead. That is what the story says. And he died on Uttarayana. What is Uttarayana? So, well, the concepts of Uttarayana and Dakshinayana are known from Vedic times. It's mentioned in texts such as Surya Siddhanta. It's mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. Uttarayana is a six-month northward course of the sun. We have just started Uttarayana now in December, uh, after December 22nd. And Dakshinayana, the sixth month, southern course of the sun. So this story is saying that as the nights become longer and longer, that is when uh, 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 Prika is chasing Rudra and the sun is fleeing away from, uh, from, from the Ashura. Then the Ashura is killed on Uttrayana, after which the sun can once again regain his glory by coming to the northern hemisphere. So clearly, Indians also knew the concept of the solar year by measuring the time from Uttarayana to Dakshinayana and back to Uttarayana. They could get uh, the duration of solar year. So we see that Indians were aware of the fact that from new moon to new moon is 29.5 days, synodic month, and the moon taking 27.3 days to orbit the earth, which is against a fixed backdrop of stars called the sidereal month, and they knew about the solar year. Reconciling between these cycles that gave enormous intellectual impetus for intellectual activity in India and several insights. For example, the insight of adding an additional intercalary month called Adhikamasa. That was done so that it could synchronize the solar year as well as the lunar year. All the yugas, the great cycles of five year cycle, 19 year cycle, the 60 year Samvatsara cycle, all the way to Chaturyuga cycle, these were all outcomes of intellectual activities of our ancestors trying to reconcile the various movements in the, in the skies and trying to uh, make sure synchronism happens at various points. This is what uh, the evidence we have from our history on these things. So we see that synodic month is marked with the tithis or the phase of the moon. Sidereal month is marked with nakshatra of the day. Solar year is marked by the uh, understanding of Uttrayana and Dakshinayana. And so we see ancient India, we had a clear understanding of marking the passage of time. And further evidence we can see in the calendar systems they used, celestial coordinate systems and measurements. Now the Indian astronomical model is one of nakshatras and Rashi. Like we already saw from the story, nakshatras are division of the sky in 13 and one third degree segments and there are 27 of them named after the wives of the moon. You see them in this outer circle, Vishaka, Chitra, Maga, and others. These are all mentioned in the outer circle. Now, Indians also had the concept of a lunar month. If the full moon appears over the Chitra nakshatra, then that month is called the Chaitra Masa. In some parts of India, they use the marker as a new moon, the Amavasya, instead of the Pournami. So in such places, you had a slight staggering by 15 days over here, and the Chaitra Masa was with the new moon rather than the full moon. In, in either case, we see that Indians have the concept of lunar month also over here. They also divided the sky in 30 degree segments in order to track the passage of the sun. So the nakshatra model was for the moon and the Rashi model was for the sun. And so uh, we see the familiar uh, Rashis over here, Meena Rashi, Mesha Rashi, Vrisha and others. These are also used in ancient India to mark the passage of the uh, sun. So we say that Indians had a loony solar calendar system to mark the passage of time.
Now, marking time itself, from very ancient times, Indians have used the muhurta, and uh, sorry, the panchanga. In the panchanga, the basic unit of time is a muhurta. It's one thirtieth of a day, or in modern concepts, it's about 48 minute interval. Now, we had a five dimensional measure of time, starting with nakshatra of the day, which is sidereal, Tithi of the day, which is synodic. Tithi refers to the phase of the moon, as you can see over here, from Prathama all the way to Amavasya, all the way to Pornami. Then we had Vara, which is a weekday. Yoga is the angle between the sun and the moon, and Karana, which is Tithi by two. In India, the day always begins at sunrise, at which point all these uh, measurements are determined. So we see that also in India, the new year, always begins with the vernal equinox, which is a highly scientific way of marking the passage of time, that vernal equinox marks the beginning of the new year. We also have evidence that ancient Indians had names for the days of the week. So there was a seven day week over here, as we can see Ravi, Soma, Mangala, Budhan, Guru, Shukran, and Shani. And the evidence for this we can see, for example, in Aryabhatiya, where it talks about uh, uh, ordering of the weekdays in association with the various grahas over here. So we are seeing, for example, seven grahas beginning with Saturn are arranged in the order of increasing velocity. And that is how the, some of these names come. Suri Siddhanta also has a similar explanation, starts talking about Saturn downwards and, and so on, and how the various weekdays are mentioned. Very interesting to note these things. Indians also mark the passage of time using months over here. We saw weekdays, before that we saw muhurta. From muhurta, we saw weekdays. From weekdays, we're seeing months now. We have solar months as well as lunar months. We've already seen the Rashi model and the, these, these names, the solar months itself. And the lunar months, like we said, either when the new moon or the full moon appears over a certain nakshatra that lends the name for that particular lunar month. And these are the names that we see in the lunar months. We also have a 60-year Samvatsara cycle. This was based on the fact that ancient Indians observed that Saturn takes 30 years to apparently do one revolution. Similarly, Jupiter is taking around 12 years to complete one revolution. They observed that the resonance of Saturn and Jupiter happens 30 times 2, which is 60, or 12 times 5, 60. Both Saturn and Jupiter will come back to the same zodiacal plane. This insight gave rise to the 60-year Samvatsara cycle, which has also been followed in all parts of India. We observe that Indians have had more than 5,000 years of measuring time and calendrical systems. And the evidence is there in the time constants and calendars, as I'm going to presently show you. So we see that the muhurta in our modern concept is 48 minutes. A day has got 30 muhurtas, which is called an ahoratram, which is a sidereal day of 24 hours. 30 ahoratrams gives one masa or 30 tithis, approximately 29.5 days, which is a synodic month. We've already seen that. Two masas make one ritu, or a season of 60 days. Three ritus make one ayana, uttarayana, dakshinayana, so on, which is approximately 180 days. Two ayanams make one varsha, a lunar year of 360 days. Now, the Rig Veda is referring to a year of 360 days. So one might wonder, what about the shortfall? We know that Indians had already measured that there's 365.24 days in the year. So what happens to that shortfall? Professor Abhyankar says in very ancient times, the shortfall was adjusted by a special yajna called Atiratra, which was done for 4.5 to 6 days, during which you do not mark the passage of time. And that brings the lunar year and solar year to synchronism over there. But then, at some point, a rishi called Rohita has already done the computations to know when to insert an intercalary month so that we bring the lunar calendar and solar calendar into synchronism. Atharva Veda 13.3.8 says Rishi Rohita created the Adhikamasa. This is also referenced in the Rig Veda. So this shows how ancient some of these concepts are that Indians are able to see the duration of the lunar year, the solar year, how to bring both of them to synchronism using mathematical concepts. All these things were known to our ancestors at a very ancient time. I'm not giving you any dates over here. 
other than saying Rig Veda and Atharva Veda that appears there. So that gives you some idea of the antiquity. We also see that as befits an ancient civilization, Indians have got a number of regional calendars because India is a big country. We are seeing divergence and of ideas and uh, the way time is marked in different parts of the country. We are seeing that we had a lunisolar calendar as well as in some parts of India, we have had a solar calendar. In the lunisolar, some parts of India follow the amanta, which means the new moon to new moon, that is a month. In some parts of India, Purni Amanta, from full moon to full moon, that is, a, 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 that is followed. Amanta is followed in southern India and in western India. Purni Amanta is followed in northern India. The solar calendars used in, in Kerala, in Odisha, in Tamil Nadu, in Bengal, and other places. In addition to these calendrical systems, we also mark the passage of time with respect to some epoch, which we call eras. And we have many eras, whether it's the Kali Yuga or the Vikrama or the Jovian cycle, Kollam cycle, Shaka cycle, Bengal cycle, and so on. We have several of them over here. If you look at this map, it also tells you about the distribution of where these calendrical systems are followed. This blue shows the lunar Purni Amantar month is followed in these parts of India, Western Amanta in Gujarat and these parts. Southern Amanta in these parts, Karnataka, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, and the solar calendar followed in Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Eastern India, Bengal, and so on. Very intriguing to connect these concepts with the traditional Puranic genealogy of the lunar dynasties and the solar dynasties, where these referencing groups of people who followed different calendrical systems. One followed on the lunar calendar, the other followed on the solar calendar. Very, very intriguing to see that how all over India we have these practices. And like I said, we also mark the passage of time with respect to some epoch. And one can reference Vedavirarya's works for more information on this. And over here, I've shown, for example, the Kali Yuga, which in the Gregorian calendar, we can mark it to 3102 BCE and several other eras. Today, we use a Shaka era, though the uh, official Shaka era is not where uh, Vedavir Arya has discovered it should be, but we are marking a wrong epoch as Shaka era in our national calendar. We'll talk about that presently. So having said this, the next thing on your mind should be, how old are the Indian calendars? So we can show evidence of very ancient marking of the passage of time in India. So the very first thing I'd like to show is how an ancient epoch is encoded in several places in India. For example, the Puranas talk about the Kali Yuga. Aryabhata, Suri Siddhanta, they refer to this epoch. Pulisa Siddhanta, Brahma Gupta, even Albaruni refer to this epoch. The temple epigraphy in Aihole in Karnataka, this also refers to this epoch. Then this Frenchman, Simon de la Luber, he, in 1687, he procured an astronomy manuscript from Thailand called Tables of Siam, and it had the longitude of Benares, and this also encodes this epoch. He couldn't figure it out. He gave it to Cassini in Italy, who was a mathematical astronomer. He studied it and declared that this Tables of Siam is referring to the epoch on midnight of February 17th, 18th, 3102 BCE. Later, Playfair, Bentley, Colebrook, Burgess, all of them colonial uh, historians, they too studied this phenomenon in Suri Siddhanta and called out the same time interval. It turns out to be a conjunction of planet, sun, moon, the Revati nakshatra. And uh, as I've simulated in this planetarium software, you can see that the sun is over here. This Revati nakshatra, you see the moon, Chandra over here, Jupiter and uh, Venus, Guru and Shukran over here. Mangala, which is Mars, is over here. Budhan, Mercury, Shani, Saturn. These are all clustered in the Revati nakshatra. Now, this does not happen every other day. The last time it happened in Revati nakshatra was about 5,000 years ago in 3102 BCE. And there's a reference to this in several Indian works like I've already shown. This gives at least a brief idea of the antiquity of the Indian calendars. The next thing to note is that Indian calendars are making use of uh, uh, sidereal time, uh, which means measuring the passage of time with respect to the moon against a fixed backdrop of the stars. When that kind of observation of time goes on, we know that it will require some amount of revision because of the phenomenon of precision. 
So if we say, remember I said that uh, Indians mark New Year at the point of vernal equinox. So the point of vernal equinox would be identified by some nakshatra that appears at that particular point. Now that nakshatra would change over thousands of years because of this phenomenon of precision. Whenever that happens, it will require that the sidereal calendar should be revised. Is there evidence of that? And yes, we see that Indian texts clearly show evidence of revising the calendars every time it is necessitated. This also is a measure of the antiquity of the Indian civilization. It also shows us mathematical astronomy at work. When we talk about Indians observing skies, we now need to have some logical, rational questions. We need to ask, what was the coordinate system that Indians used? How could they measure something of the spherical uh, 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 skies over there? So we know that Indians knew the cardinal points of astronomy, where the winter solstice happened, summer solstice, vernal equinox, autumn equinox. They knew the reference planes, the horizon, the ecliptic as a path of the sun. They knew the equator. They knew the reference point, the celestial poles, north, south, east, west direction, as well as zenith up above. And so with these coordinates, one could uh, start now talking about measurements and locating objects on, on this plane, reference plane and so on. If we say Indians were measuring the skies, we must next ask, where is the evidence of this? Well, the evidence is there all over the place, starting from Harappa in 3000 BCE, we see uh, archeological remains of water clocks, which is used to measure the passage of time. Vedanga Jyotisha in 1400 BC also refers to water clocks to measure time. By the time you come to Aryabhata, we are seeing that he's talking about various yantras over here, shadow instruments, semicircle instruments, star circle, and so on, including Nomen. Aryabhata even had a globe which he could operate with the rope. And with that, he talked about the shadow that the earth casts, the moon casts, and the rotation of the earth. All those concepts were well known to Aryabhata, and he described it with the globe that he had constructed. By the time you come to Varaha Mihira, He's talking about graphic calculation in addition to track the passage of celestial objects and several instruments to do that. Brahmagupta is talking about the quadrant and, uh, and a bowl for hemispherical sundial and other such things. Bhaskara Vaughan is talking about circular platform with graduated circumference. Very, very interesting. When I went to Lothal in uh, Gujarat a few years ago, I saw in Lothal these kind of structures over here these round structures and nobody had a clue what they were. They thought some post or some such thing. However, I could make the connection saying that this seems to be the same thing Bhaskara one is describing. It was used for some astronomical purpose in order to measure the skies. Then by the time we come to Lalla, he's talking about armillary sphere. He's, uh, we, are, we, are, we are now talking about that, including the needles and other such thing. Mahendra Suri, we are talking about Islamic times now. He had astrolabes like this, with which he could uh, uh, track the passage of the objects in skies. And Maharaja Jai Singh, in European times, he also had uh, brass instruments made out of, of uh, uh, European ideas and so on. So we see that we have a history of about 5,000 years in measuring the skies. All right, so we have the measurement devices. We know Indians are measuring the skies. What is the coordinate system? Today, we have three coordinate systems, the equatorial coordinate system. In many of the go-to telescopes, computerized telescopes, you might find the equatorial tripods which track the skies in a certain way, or you might find the altitude azimuth coordinate system used to uh, track the skies. Ancient Indians used the ecliptic coordinate system based on the passage of the sun, that is the ecliptic, and the reference point the zero longitude, where did that meridian happen? That meridian happened at the point of uh, uh, vernal equinox. That was a zero longitude for Indians. And because they use a sidereal means to uh, track the vernal equinox point, we know that it changes with precision. So it necessitates changing the reference point in Indian astronomy. Do we have evidence of that? Yes, we have. The nakshatra at vernal equinox was Brigashirsha in 4000 BCE, Rohini in 3000 BC, Kritika 2300 BCE, and so on. So we know by the references and various Indian texts, we know that the reference point has been changing as necessitated by precision. That brings us to the next question. What is this precision? 
Now the precession is a, a degree of uh, motion that the earth is doing in addition to rotation in 24 hours, in addition to revolution around the sun in 365.24 days, the earth has got one more uh, uh, motion over here. The axis of rotation, the earth is rotating about this axis and today it is pointing to Polaris, which we call Dhruva. And it seems to be, that seems to be an immobile star in the sky and we are rotating about that. This axis of rotation traces a slow path in the sky going all the way from Polaris till the star called Abhijit or Vega in Greek notation. This, this path will take about 12,000 years and 12,000 years will point to that. Eventually it will trace a full circle and come back over here. For example, 5,000 years ago, Thuban was Dhruva for our ancient uh, uh, Indians who recorded several things. It was Thuban that was a pole star. And after that, the next bright pole star is Polaris. So this is the precession cycle. The question on your mind should then be, did Indians know about precision? If you believe Professor Pingree from City University of New York, he seemed to think that no, Indians did not know about precision till Varamira learned about it from the Greeks. That was his assertion. However, we see that's a bogus assertion. Uh, the, the, the notion of precision or trepidation is very well known even in Suri Siddhanta. Suri Siddhanta is saying the circle of asterism liberates 600 times in a great yuga. A great yuga means a chatur yuga. It, it moves westward by 27 from zero degrees. It moves uh, zero point, it moves 27 degrees. Then it returns back to zero, goes to minus 27, returns back to zero. So this was the way Suri Siddhanta was referring to this. And Professor Emil Raja of Avinash Research, he's explaining this. He says in this 4.32 million Chatur Yuga system, Suri Siddhanta's data says it completes 600 revolutions. That means it takes 7,200 years per revolution as referred to in Suri Siddhanta, which means in one year, we compute the precision rate called Ayana Chalana is 600 revolutions multiplied by 27 degrees, multiplied by four segments over here, multiplied by 60 minutes, multiplied by 60 degree, uh, sorry, uh, seconds, divided by 4.32 million years, gives a figure of 54 arc seconds per year. That was the rate of precision as noted in the ancient Indian text of Suri Siddhanta. You might wonder, all right, did other civilizations of the world also know about precision and what was their estimate of precision? Yes, we can make a study of that. Suri Siddhanta, I refuse to put a date on it because it has got some very ancient uh, uh, observations in addition. It's a compilation of works. This is like we uh, saw, estimated as 54 arc seconds per year. Parashara Siddhanta, which can be dated by Professor Arna Ingar is dated it to the same time as Vedanga Jyotisha, which makes it 1400 BCE. That too repeats 54 arc seconds. And I believe it has come from Suri Siddhanta's uh, measurement. Vritta Garga, Abhyankar puts into 500 BCE. He refers to uh, 36 arc seconds per year. And Hipparchus, the Greek, in 120 BCE repeats the same figure as Vidigarga, showing that he's just repeating what Vidigarga knew. In China, in 300 current era, this man referred, uh, measured it at 72 arc seconds a year, which is greatly in error, as you can see. Aryabhata, in around 500 current era, measured it to 48 arc seconds per year, which is much better than Suri Siddhanta's figure. Al-Batani, who was an Arab. Now, these Arabs copied everything from India after Bin Qasim's invasion of Sindh, the Baghdad House of Wisdom. Uh, they copied almost all of Indian mathematics, astronomy, and so on. So they repeat the same figure that is there in Suri Siddhanta, 54 arc seconds a year. Munjala uh, computed at 59.9 uh, arc seconds per year. He also proposed circular precision. And Bhaskara II, got it to 48.6 arc seconds a year in the year 1150 current era, which is very, very uh, close to the actual figure. Raja Jay Singh, he got it to 51.6 arc seconds a year in 1600s. And Patani Samantha Chandrasekhar in the year 1900 in Odisha, using Indian classical methods and naked eye observations, he got it to 49.179 arc seconds a year, very, very close to the estimate of the correct estimate is 50.2 arc seconds a year. So we see that sidereal coordinates for Indians always starts at the vernal equinox, marking the position of the new year. It's called the Nirayana system because it's a sidereal system. 
Sidereal year is measured when the sun reappears in Mesha Rashi. In the Sayana system, which is tropical, the year is measured from vernal equinox to the next point of vernal equinox. It is shorter than the sidereal year by 20 minutes. So if at some point both the Nirayana and the Sayana system co uh, coincided, like for example in Aryabhata's time, then because of precision, these coordinates will slip by 50.2 arc seconds a year. This slippage is called in India, Ayanamsa or Ayanachalana. Lalla had measured six degrees of Ayanamsa in his time in 638 current era. This shows deep understanding of precision by ancient Indians. Well, this idea of precision, notion of precision is present in many, many Indian texts, but I'd like to call out two of them, the story of Dhruva and Aditi to show the antiquity of the Indian calendar. Story of Dhruva comes in the Vishnu Purana. Dhruva's father, the king, had two wives, Surachi, the favored younger wife, and Suniti, the Dhruva's mother. And Dhruva had an unhappy childhood because his father favored his stepbrother, ignored him, and his stepmother was very harsh, and she removed him from his father's lap, saying, you have no place over here. Suniti tries to console a distraught son with a message of karma, but five-year-old Dhruva is determined to leave home and ask Vishnu itself, what is my place in this universe? And as he's uh, wandering about, he meets the Saptarishis who tell him how to meditate on Vishnu and he goes about doing tapasya and eventually Vishnu appears, but Dhruva wants nothing. So uh, Vishnu makes him into a motionless star in the sky. And uh, uh, this encodes the fact that our axis of rotation points to Dhruva and even the Saptarishis will go in Pradakshina around Dhruva. That is what is recounted over here. And this refers to this fact. If you have a DSLR camera, put it on a tripod, point it to the north after sunset and open the shutter for a few hours of exposure, then you're going to see these star trails where this star appears to be immobile. That is the axis of rotation of the earth pointing to the latitude in which you live. And then you see these smaller radius circles, larger and larger circles as the stars appear to go around uh, Dhruva. Now we can date the Dhruva story because the Purana says when Vishnu gave pole star status to Dhruva, he also said your mother Suniti will be a star nearby. Well, if we look at our present times, we have uh, this Polaris, which is our pole star, which we call Dhruva, but there is no nearby star as Vishnu has promised. But if you crank back the planetarium software in time and go to 3000 BCE, we see that Thuban becomes a pole star and there's a tiny star next to Thuban which is referenced in the Vishnu Purana as Suniti, his mother. So clearly we can see that using precision, we can date the time of Dhruva's story about 5,000 years ago to 3000 BCE. One more fascinating story. This comes from Aitriya Brahmana of the Rig Veda. This is a Martin Hall translation. It says, the sacrifices of Yagna went away from the Devdas the gods were unable to perform any further ceremony. They did not know how to perform it. They did not know where the sacrifice had gone to. They went to uh, Aditi and said, let us know the sacrifice through thee. Aditi said, let it be so, but I will choose a bone from you. They said, choose. Then she said, all yajnas will begin and end with me. It was a reference to the change in calendar. Clearly, this episode noted in the Aitriya Brahmana is saying, how ancient Indians used to mark their yajnas and their festivals with respect to the sidereal calendar, with respect to the vernal equinox position. But over thousands of years, the nakshatra that is supposed to be there has changed. So they don't know when to do their functions, when to do the festivals. So they have reset the calendar to Aditi. That is what is mentioned over here. The new year will begin and end with her. That's what Aditi is saying. So our question now is what is this Aditi in relation to the nakshatras? Aditi and her co-sister Diti were the wives of uh, Rishi Kashyapa. Collectively, they are known as a Punarvashu nakshatra. So this is referencing Punarvashu nakshatra at the vernal equinox position. When did that happen? Well, if we crank the planetarium software back in time and go to 6000 BCE, when we have the vernal equinox over here, sun is in the celestial equator over here, and it is in Punarvashu. Here we have uh, Aditi, and here we have Diti. In the Greek tradition, this is called Castor and Pollux. These are the two stars. 
So Aitriya Brahmana seems to have a memory of when the calendar was reset to Aditi. And this is now 6,000 BCE or a staggering 8,000 years old. So this gives you an idea of how ancient Indian calendars are being and how precisely our ancestors are able to mark the passage of time. Now, the antiquity of Indian calendars could be much more ancient than that. But uh, some references are there, uh, as Professor Abhyankar has laid out in his book, and he's calling out the reference points for Indian calendar at various periods of time. And here we can see, for example, 7000 BCE, the Nakshatra at Vernal Equinox was Pushya. 6000 BC, it was Punar Vashud, as I just said, Aditi Punar Vashud. 5000 BC, Ardra, and so on. And uh, uh, in our own time, around the year 2000, we have Purva Bhadrapada. That is the nakshatra in our times. Just by looking at this uh, uh, table over here, one can get an understanding of how ancient the civilization has been and how meticulously they track the passage of time. So with that, I'd like to now talk to you about spurious Western assertions about the Indian civilizations and the history of calendar systems in other parts of the world. So we see that uh, the, using linguistics uh, ideas and so on, the, the, the colonial historians came with the idea that there was something called Aryan invasion to India, which happened around 1500 BC. Later on, this got turned to a migration event, but it does not matter whether it's invasion or migration is as spurious as ever. So they claimed that illiterate nomads from Central Asia invaded or migrated to India and they destroyed the superior Harappa civilization. And India was overrun with these illiterate people with their caste, with their cows, with their curry and uh, all their illiterate behaviors. And India had to wait for thousand years before civilization returned in Eastern India and Magadha, after Magadha made contact with the Greeks in 300 BC, suddenly we became civilized because we had Brahmi script and that made us civilized. Then the Westerners say, now you know your civilization is a young one. You have not had enough time for knowledge generation. Gestation time is not good enough. So if you have advanced works in mathematics, astronomy and medicine, you must have learned it from earlier civilizations like the Greeks, Babylonians, Egyptians, and so on. So this is the way it is positioned. So they tell us that Aryans brought Sanskrit into India from Central Asia. Brahmi came from the Aramaic script from Levant, Semitic script into India. Math and sciences were taught to us by the Greeks. The Babylonians taught us how to do astronomy. The Turkic Muslims taught us culture, cuisine, architecture, music, and civilization. And the British taught us how to be a scientific and rational thought and so on. So the denial of agency in narrating our history as per our textual evidence and other evidence has resulted in gross distortion of who we are as a people. And this distorts the history of Indian civilization, the chronology, anchor points, every aspect of our knowledge systems, including our identity. So it's very important to keep this in mind. Having said that, we can now ask, what were the calendar systems like in other ancient civilizations? Well, we know that the ancient Egyptians, at least in a, around 2500 BCE, they had a civil calendar. They knew the solar year with 365 days per year. They had three seasons per year with 120 days each, which comes to 360 days, just like the Indian lunar calendar. And they treated intercalary month of five days outside the year, just like the Atiratra sacrifice in India, they too conducted a sacrifice and treated it outside the year. For the common people, they had a loony solar calendar for festivals, just like in India, with intercalary month added every third after three years to synchronize the solar. And the Egyptians also marked vernal equinox as the beginning of the new year, just like Indians. Ancient Babylonian calendar, we know at least from 1500 BCE, they too had a lunisolar calendar with 12 lunar months, and they began their month with crescent moon sighting on the western horizon at sunset. Indians marked the nakshatra at sunrise, and they did the opposite at sunset. The intercalary month was inserted by as needed by royal decree. When they find slippages happen, then they insert a month. After 500 BC, it was much more regulated by the 19-year Maiden cycle. And they too, in Babylon, marked vernal equinox 
mark the beginning of the new year. So we see so many parallels with ancient Indians is there in Egypt as well as in Babylon. What about the ancient Greeks? Well, they had a calendar at least from 500 BCE, or that is what some people speculate, that beginning between autumn and winter, 12 lunar months, they did not have the concept of intercalary months. So their year was 354 days. Every different parts of Greece had different calendars. The Athens calendar was called uh, Attic calendar, more popular, 12 months of 29 to 30 days. And they added an intercalary month for alignment. And their calendar, the new year was in the new moon after the summer solstice. What about the ancient Romans? The Roman original calendar was lunar, the 12 months of 29 to 30 days. But people are not very sure. So they think they must have used some intercalation. Cal and there's only a speculation. Or they say they might have suspended their calendar during winter months. And this gives an example. Their calendar begins in March because, it, again, their vernal equinox marked the new year. So in vernal equinoxes in March, so they measured it from there. March, April, May, June goes up to December. You find that January and February are missing. So the length of their year was 304 days. So clearly we are seeing that some of these civilizations are struggling to measure the passage of time. Calendar suspended during winter months. But the Julian calendar came about with Julius Caesar in 46 BCE with an epoch referring to the year 753 BCE, which is uh, uh, Rome's founding. This calendar was used for 1600 years in Europe and it had 12 months of 30 and 31 days with 365 days in normal year and 366 every fourth year in the leap year. And we see that Byzantines modified this to reference to the uh, Christian era and so on. So looking at the Julian calendar, we see that, uh, like I said, proposed by Julius Caesar in 46 BCE, and he replaced January 1st as the new year. And the reason for doing that is because March was normally used, but then their divinity was Janus. Janus was the divinity associated with beginning new things. Just like in India, we have Ganesha, as a, before we do anything, we propagate, uh, we pray to Ganesha before doing that. Just like that, you're seeing that uh, the Romans had Janus, and Janus is the January month. So he replaced January 1st at the beginning of the new year, and a leap year added every fourth year. And we see errors have accumulated over time. And this is the uh, length of the year before 45 BC. They had a year with 360, 55 days or up to 378 days, greatly in error. Then after 45 BCE, 365 to 366 days, and so on. So now I'd like to point out how this Julian calendar was co-opted by the Christians and the Christianization of that happened. We see that Christian monks, they modified the Julian calendar. To see that, the first concept we see is Anno Mundi. Anno Mundi refers to the Christian notion of the year of the world. So their calendrical systems are based on biblical stories of uh, cosmology, how, when God created the world and those kinds of things. Now the Hebrew calendar is placing the creation epoch to 6 October 3761 BCE. The Byzantine Christians from 412 current era, they used the same Julian calendar, but they changed the epoch. Julius Caesar was using 753 BC, founding of Rome by the Romulus brothers, that was the uh, starting of uh, their calendar. But the Christians changed it to the creation epoch on the vernal equinox, March 25th, approximately 5500 BCE. This is based on the Greek idea that Jesus was born 5,500 years after the biblical creation event. And they also thought that the world would end uh, 6,000 years after creation. So once Jesus is born, they thought 500 years after Jesus, there'll be the second coming and the world would end and so on. So this is the Anno Mundi idea. Eventually, it is changed to Anno Domini by this person called Dionysus Exigus. So it refers to something called Year of the Lord. It is devised in the year 525 current era by this man. And his purpose was to create Easter tables. They believe the death of Christ was an Easter and they wanted to mark the passage of that time. And how do you know when it is Easter? Because clearly they don't have a very good idea of marking the passage of time. And he wanted to do that. 
He also wanted to remove a reference to Roman persecutors of Christians. The eras at that time, the Julian calendar, referenced Roman emperors. These, some of these Roman emperors persecuted Christians and he did not want to, uh, their memory to remain. To erase that, he also uh, created this concept. He computed 95 future Easter dates to remove the superstition of end of the world 500 years after Christ. So the, the notion that he introduced, Anno Domini, is uh, uh, summarized as AD, and this has become popular to mark the era. And this became popular only from the ninth century onwards. People have started using this. Another important Catholic uh, uh, observance is the Feast of Annunciation. So in Christian mythology, the Archangel Gabriel, it announces to Mary that she's carrying the Son of God. And that happens on a certain date, and that is the Feast of Annunciation. In fact, Luke uh, chapter 128 calls out the angelic salutation of Gabriel to Mary. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And Mary's response, be it done to me according to thy word. So this is the observance that they are marking over here. And it turns out that the speech of Annunciation is done on 25th March. Why 25th March? Because it marked the day of the vernal equinox. It marked the creation day 5,500 years before Christ. And in a sense, this is the, this is the start of pregnancy for uh, Mary about uh, uh, in March going all the way down to December when he would be born. So it marks that date also, the date of Annunciation. Eventually, Christ is also killed, uh, which they believe in Easter around this day, the death of Christ, as well as marking the new year. For all these reasons, 25th March is used. And as we know evidence that has been celebrated from 656 current era onwards through the Council of Toledo, we have got understanding of this. The Catholics also observed something they referred to as circumcision of Christ. Now, uh, uh, Christ was born as a Jew and Jewish boys, as we know, were circumcised. And they traditionally have observed January 1st as a circumcision of Christ. And the reference to this goes again to Luke, one of the gospels, the second chapter 21. And when eight days were fulfilled after his birth, that is to circumcise the child, his name was called Jesus, the name called by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So this has been celebrated by both the Orthodox Church as well as the Catholic Church with a service which they call All Night Vigil from December 31st onwards, it goes into the new year. So the Gregorian calendar came about and restored January 1st as the beginning of the new year. Till then, it was uh, uh, March 25th and, and so on. So January 1st has become a new year with a Gregorian. So we had to see what is this Gregorian calendar. So this Gregorian calendar came about in 1582 current era. So we know that the Julian leap year system overcompensates the length of the solar year. We know that the, uh, the Earth takes 365.24 days to go around the Earth. This fractional point, 0.24 days, that is the issue. So in counting the days, they rounded it to 365 days. So 365 days is too little and 366 days is too much. So the Julian uh, approach was every fourth year will add one more day. So by doing that, they averaged the duration of Earth's uh, revolution to 365.25 days. That 25 is also too much because the correct figures 0.24 odd. That's what it is. So we see that by using Julian system, we are overcompensating the length of the solar year. And the impact is there's an additional day in the calendar every 128 years. So it's, the calendar gets keeps getting slipped. But this was not known in Europe because the literacy level was pretty poor and it was not corrected. By the time we come to 1582, the seasons have dropped off by 10 days. So if they wanted to celebrate Easter, it looked like 10 days have already passed since that vernal equinox time. So the authorization came from Pope Gregory the 13th and 10 days were dropped from Jupiter from October. So till that time, the synchronism between Julian calendar and Gregorian calendar, but on October 4th, they drop 10 days in the Gregorian calendar and go to uh, October 15th. That is how the Gregorian calendar came about. And, and we also see that in the, in, the, in the Gregorian calendar, additionally, 
uh, 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 we, we, are, we are seeing this uh, 10 days have been uh, slipped over here. A lot of confusion in European uh, uh, dating of events based on this wrong calendrical systems. We are seeing between 1582 and 1752, two calendar systems have been used. Now the Catholic countries, one after the other, they started adopting the Gregorian system after 1582. However, the Protestants, they did not want to do that. And the British were also Protestant Anglican Church and the British Empire and the colonies in USA, they continued to use the Julian system. In addition to two calendar systems, even the beginning of the new year, that was also different. The Catholics with Gregorian system observed January 1st as a new year. And the others, the Julian system observed March 25th, vernal equinox as the new year. So in 1750, the British Empire, by an act of parliament, they decided to flip over to the Gregorian calendar by 1752. So in 1752, they formally got the Gregorian calendar. However, the changeover was not direct. They had to do a lot of jumping through hoops. For example, December 31st, 1750 was followed by January 1st, 1750 once again. So they repeated the year in a sense over here. Then March 24th, 1750 was followed by March 25th, 1751. So strange things were done to the calendrical system so that they'll come back and synchronize it. That is what we see here. There were also attempts to backdate because they used Julian calendar till October 4th. So they wanted to backdate everything with a Gregorian calendar. This is called a proleptic Gregorian calendar, but it led to much confusion because of all these kind of issues. And what we see is with multiple systems, unscientific calendars, much of Western dating is subjective. One has got to be careful whenever you see a date prior to 1782 or so, one, one has got to ask what, what exactly, 1752, you have to ask what date is this based on? What are the ideas it is based on? Our next idea is when did this Gregorian calendar even come into India? Today it's entrenched in India. In 1752, when the British adopted this calendar, they introduced this in the occupied territories in India. And we know that in 1700s, the Maratha Confederacy had taken over a lot of uh, India and you had the uh, uh, Mysore kingdoms over here and you had other kingdoms over here. The Mughals had retreated to Delhi. The East India Company had entrenched itself in Bengal, in some parts in this coastal part of Orissa and Andhra, and in Tamil Nadu near Madras, they also occupied. So in these areas, they introduced this Gregorian calendar. However, the Panchanga continued to be in widespread use in India. Well, since independence, Indians decided to once again see what is the calendar we should follow. And unfortunately, it was Nehru and Nehruvian socialism at the helms. And we adopted a national calendar based on Shaka era with Chaitra as the first month, the normal year of 365 days adopted from 22nd March, 1957 by syncing it up to the Gregorian calendar for these purposes to make the Gazette of India, news broadcast on All India Radio, calendars used by government of India, as well as government communications to the public. For these reasons, this calendar was used. It has got a permanent correspondence with Gregorian calendar. One Chaitra falls on 22nd March, normally, and in a leap year, 21st March. So what we see is it is following the Sayana system, which is tropical. Unfortunately, in India, we've got a long history of using sidereal calendrical systems, as I've shown, going back 8,000 years and so on. We cannot use Nirayana calendar with our national calendar because of this reason. It is my opinion, but I believe that it would have made much more sense to use Kali epoch because that will encompass 5,000 years of history, at least 5,000 years of history, rather than this uh, uh, poor uh, marker of Shaka era, which Vedvir Arya is calling out, even this is erroneous. So we have some problems in our national calendar. That is the bottom line. So given all this information, when should Hindus celebrate New Year? Well, vernal equinox has always been used by India for thousands and thousands of years, as I've shown in my presentation, to celebrate the New Year. 
it is a nationwide festival, whether it's Northern India, Southern India, Eastern India, Western India, we have got festivals in this Burnley Equinox time. And here are some samples from various parts of India, whether it's called Yugadi or Vishu or Tamil Pudantu or Guri Padva or Cheti Chand or Poila Baisaki or Baisaki or uh, Rongali Bihu. We are seeing that in different parts of India, we are observing this new year. And this has got to be the Hindu New Year which we celebrate, in which case we are now making connection with our ancient past going to 8,000 years. If instead we are marking uh, uh, November, December 31st and January 1st as a new year, we have problems because you're marking an alien notion, the circumcision of Christ and alien symbolism, nothing to do with the Indian civilization at all. So we need to continue marking our Hindu New Year at the vernal equinox point. So with that, my closing remarks, ancient Indian calendars date back to great antiquity. It's attested by astronomy, as I've shown. Indians used a lunisolar calendar with intercalary months, very, very precise scientific ways of marking time. They understood that adjustments had to be done because of precision. And going back to Aitriya Brahmana, we are seeing even 8,000 years ago, they knew they had to keep resetting the calendar to make sure they were tracking time correctly. And we have sh shown that measurements were done. Various measurement devices were known in India to track celestial bodies. Mathematics was used to estimate the periods of some of these uh, heavenly bodies. They had models of increasing complexity of the astronomical objects with which they could do predictions and so on. So we saw that Indians had a well-defined calendar system to accurately mark the passage of time. And this is a mark of great civilization. We also reviewed calendars of the ancient world and we showed that how the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Greek, the Romans, all struggled with the notion of marking time. Some of them neglected marking time during winter months. Some of them could not have intercalary months. So several issues are there in various parts of the ancient world, whereas Indians were fairly precise in their measuring of time. We also noticed, noted the European, Julian and Gregorian calendars how they have been adjusted for significance to Christian symbolism and how they have unreliable Western dating. If you go back prior from 1700s onwards, there's a lot of uncertainty. One has got to ask, is your date based on Gregorian calendar or the, the Julian calendar and, uh, and all those approximations they have done? One has got to be careful over there. So Hindus need to be aware of celebrating Christian symbolism because this is happening at the expense of their own scientific calendar systems. So with that, I end my talk over here. You can follow me on Twitter at Rajvedambon or write to me at this address, or you can go to YouTube and search for my name and see some of my talks on these subjects or follow me on Kuwa or also on Facebook. So thank you very much for listening to this talk.